Good afternoon. What better way to spend Saturday? A bright, sunny Saturday than looking at curly brackets and being locked away from the sunshine. <laughs> so I'm going to hold you back for another hour. Um, I'm going to talk about um, this thing. Um, uh, my name is Kevin Henning, which my parents had incredible insight before the creation of the internet and indeed Twitter, could there be such a thing in time for these things, um, they gave me a name that is actually fairly unique, um, so my name is my internet name, um, I'm thinking of changing it so I get the at in front as well, I'm not sure how it will play with a passport service in the UK. Um, so, things I do, I've um, written a couple of books, um, which are made in Chinese, uh, <laughs> conveniently enough, there is actually uh, an English version uh, of each. Um, uh, if, you, if you want a Dutch version, I'm afraid you'll have to just try and get drunk, read them, and pretend to speak German. That should be a rough approximation. <laughs> How close am I there? Yeah. Um, but. What I'm going to talk about here is sort of a mix of some of my long-term uh, interests. My interest in um, software architecture, sort of the, the design of little things, the detail of code, and the practices we put into them. And the question of how does code, piece of software, product, unfold when we create it? And this is one of those little things that the books were always a bit bit light on, they would show you images and models and so on and say, this is what you want, you want it to be like this. Well, that seems very good. The problem is they don't tell you how to get there. There's a little detail between we want to build this and look what we've built that needs to be filled in. Software cannot be created instantaneously, so you have to take steps. It also turns out that we're not very good at predicting the future. In fact, we're not very good at predicting the present. Um, simple demonstrations, if you look, at, um, if you look at more than one news outlet on a given day reporting the same news, you will get a very different perspective. And that's just about something that just happened in the immediate past. Don't worry about the future. We're hopeless at it, and yet we fool ourselves that we can do this. It'll be different this time. We know the exact nature of the product. And we know what people want. We know what the customers want. And we know all of these things. We have this great knowledge that gets, surprisingly, um, proven wrong every single time. We are like children. Children are persistent and tenacious. Now, maybe it'll be right one day. So, what I want to look at is a, something from another book. There's a kind of connection here with the pattern stuff. Um, this book, um, by a guy called Dick Gabriel, he wrote the foreword to the fifth volume software architecture book. Uh, he's been intimately involved in the patents community um, since uh, the beginning. Um, and he wrote this book, Patents of Software, in the mid-90s. Um, the hard copy is no longer available, um, but you can get the PDF from his uh, website. It's partly autobiographical, part, you know, it's a bit about his time in the industry. It's partly about patents, it's partly about Product uh, and product development, partly about this thing we call software and programming. So uh, there's, a, there's a mix of things in there. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is in this book he covers and explores in a little more detail um, a theory that he introduced um, nearly a quarter of a century ago called Worse is Better. Uh, has anybody heard, except for the title of my talk, has anybody heard of the Worse is Better theory? Just uh, Okay. Um, the problem with this theory is that the name is completely wrong. And the problem is that in software development, names really matter. Okay, we're really bad at naming stuff, but it's one of the most important things we do. Uh, as I sort of try to emphasize to people, you only got to express yourself in software. You've only got punctuation, indentation, and naming. That's it. There is nothing else in software. Okay? That's all you have. These three things. So whenever people sort of say, oh, we've got this variable here. What's it called? E. 
<laughs> okay, you know, that's Euler's constant. No, it's an exception. Well, tell me something about the exception. Oh, you mean I should change it to x, maybe? No, 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 that's wrong. Some people are bold enough to even combine the e and the x. See? Meaningful variable name. Two letters. Okay, I remember having a machine where I could use two letters in the name. That was amazing. It was 30 years ago. I, thought, I, I just didn't know what I was going to do with a second letter. I got so used to single letter variable names. But that's it. That's all we have to express ourselves with. And this also applies to our practices and the techniques that we talk about. So it's unfortunate that Dick, who normally spends so much care and attention on naming things, kind of named it the worse is better uh, approach. Um, you'll see why, because it turns out a lot of people misinterpret this as worse is better. Do a bad job, because you can rush it to market, and that will be better. So many people who've come across this theory misinterpret it as just do something that's really sloppy. Don't worry about the bugs. Don't worry about the quality of the code. Don't worry about these things. Uh, just get it out there. And once you've got the, f once you've got the first product out there, you'll, you know, your customers will bite, and they will come in, and you can hook them, and you can do the next version. That's totally not what the worse is better theory is about, as we, as we discover. In 1990, I proposed a theory called worse is better, of why software would be more likely to succeed if it was developed with minimal invention. Ah, that sounds completely different. That sounds like less is more. That sounds like uh, a more... Not a worse approach, but a reduced scope approach. And this is 1990. People have got a little more used to the concept of reducing scope in recent times. But this is 11 years before the Agile Manifesto came out. It's um, five years before Kent Beck sent an email to Jeff Sutherland saying, I hear you've got this pattern language for development called Scrum. Could I borrow some ideas? And then extreme programming was born. So this is going back quite a way. It's a time in 1990 when, when people used the word iterative development and they talked about iterations. Now, just out of interest, people doing, uh, people doing scrum and stuff like that, just get a rough shake. Okay, how long is your sprint? Two weeks. Two weeks, yeah, that's become standard. Um, back then, an iteration, when you talked about iterative development, people sort of said, yeah, an iteration, yeah, we've got iterations, they're about three to six months long. Okay. When Scrum came along, its original life cycle was 30 days. That was the standard, 30 calendar days. But two weeks has been, you know, standard. So the point here is that this approach goes back a long way. And we, it turns out, when you revisit it, you can still learn a few things. Um, it is far better to have an underfeatured product that is rock solid, fast, and small than one that covers what an expert would consider the complete requirements. Notice the way that this is totally unlike just throw something together and ship it. Rock solid. We just threw it together and it happened to be totally robust. <laughs> Fast. Yeah. We're talking performance here. Surely performance is a detail that you deal with later. Turns out that the, mo the, 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 the largest difference to usability that any, uh, you can ever make is to do with performance. I noticed that with um, various apps. You have, you have, in terms of response, you have a budget of 100 milliseconds to do something when somebody presses a button. You have less than 100 milliseconds to get back to them with something, otherwise they'll press it again. Okay? That we, we don't, humans don't operate much faster than that, but we really notice it. You hit 200 milliseconds and people still, it's broken. There's something wrong. It didn't go and press again. Okay? So you, that's your budget, your time budget. And most frustrations with software disappear based on speed to leave all the other frustrations we have with it. But it's nice to get the easy ones out of the way first. So the following is a characterization of the contrasting design philosophy. He referred to this as being like the right thing. What experts and architects and many developers would characterize, they'd say, simplicity. Yes, everybody loves simplicity. The design is simple, but the simplicity of implementation is less important. We don't care about that. We care about the overall look of the architecture, the interface. These must be simple. But the simplicity of the implementation, not relevant. Completeness. The design covers as many important situations as possible. All reasonably expected cases must be covered. The question is, what is reasonably expected? This is where we start hitting the problem with predicting the future. 
And so this idea of completeness sets in. Correctness, the design is correct in all observable aspects. Seems, on, you know, seems reasonable. And consistency, the design is thoroughly consistent. A design is allowed to be slightly less simple and less complete in order to avoid inconsistency. But consistency is as important as correctness. This is how it's structured. So this is this perspective. Now, the problem here to do with the com is primarily to do with the completeness aspect. Because in order to be complete, you must know, you must have a very good idea of the scope. And of course, people are quite happy to tell you what they think. We need this. We need that. Um, the problem is, it turns out that when you ask people for their requirements, they just make stuff up. They have no idea. And that's not because they're customers. That's because they're human beings. Because human beings do not walk around with itemized, prioritized lists in their head, ready to respond. Yeah, my wife and I used to spend ages in the pub just answering the simple question. OK, so what are your top five films? What are your top five? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. It depends on the day of the week. It depends on my mood. Uh, you know, am I happy or sad? You know, I'd do anything to avoid answering that question. Because I don't walk around with a top five list in my head. Your brain is this big associative mess. I mean, it's a lot like code in some ways. OK? <laughs> we create the things based on who we are. Yeah? It's a reflection of who we are. But this is a problem. We don't walk around with an itemized list like this. So when you ask somebody, we need to know your requirements, they will make stuff up, just as you would if you were asked, what's your top 10 things? OK? So of course, it's a complete work of fiction. And the other thing is, when you, the, minute, the minute they speak to somebody else on a different day, they'll have a different top ten. The minute they actually see what you've produced, it'll change again. It's a highly volatile thing. It's nothing to do with being a customer. As I said, it's part of the human condition. The problem is a lot of the ways we assume that this works is not based on the human condition. It assumes that we have a certain level of omniscience. So we end up cramming. We pull things forward. We say, well, we missed this last time, so let's just anticipate more, anticipate more. And this leads to a loss of the first thing, the simplicity. And as that spirals away, we lose our grip on the correctness and indeed any consistency it ever had. It also pushes back deadlines. It creates a lot of uh, challenges. It's not very responsive. Let's try this. Here are the characteristics of a worse is better software design. Simplicity. The design is simple in implementation. The interface should be simple, but anything adequate will do. This really annoys UX people. <laughs> As does the study a couple of years ago by some guys at the University of Basel and the University of Copenhagen that revealed that primarily what we consider to be beautiful, there was this old quote going around, Something that is beautiful is usable. No, it turns out that if something is usable, it is considered more beautiful. In other words, our aesthetics are actually driven in part, and very a much larger part than people anticipated, by utility. If I, if I know how to use it, then it, it becomes beautiful. Yeah? It, 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 is, it has an aesthetic quality that I appreciate. So we're going here, anything adequate. That doesn't mean you, you head out to do something really bad. I am programmer. I will write it all as a command line. Yeah, I know, but I'm trying to buy books. <sighs> I will do no validation. You will just have to guess from the error codes what is wrong. That's, that is adequate. No, 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 no. Not for mere mortals, no. So adequate do, do, does, set a, does set a lower bar. But we are saying, actually, there's something else going on here in terms of the emphasis. The implementation, this is interesting. We're going to see the properties of that. Completeness, the design covers only necessary situations. We're going to go from a maximalist approach to a minimalist approach. Find out the necessary situations. Completeness can be sacrificed in favor of any other quality. Previously, it was simplicity and consistency that could be sacrificed. But this is, completeness can be sacrificed. In other words, reduced scope. The idea is that, well, <laughs> if you want to add stuff, it's called software for a reason. It should be soft. Yeah? This, is, this is not like adding new floors on a, on a building. It's not like saying, you know that car? I think it would be so much cooler with six wheels. You know, this, is, this is not a re... It's, we, have, we lost the idea that actually softness is an intrinsic part of the thing we call software, or should be. We approach it as if it's immutable. 
The design is correct in all observable aspects. That is unchanged. The design is consistent as far as it goes. Interesting, it's not pushing this one as far, but it turns out there's a reason. Consistency is less of a problem because you always choose the smallest scope for the first implementation. You have less space to make it inconsistent. And this is really interesting because we can see here there is a parallel. There is a parallel with a lot of what people talk about in agile design approaches, but there's a few little nuances here that are, are missing. And let's go to the implementation characteristics. The implementation should be fast. Speed matters. Speed gives you the response and the feedback that people want when they're using a product. If they're going to use an API, if they're going to use an actual end user product, um, you don't want to be in their way. The minute you introduce performance problems, you get in their way. This is actually why um, it's not an implementation detail. Now, there's this careful balance. There's uh, the uh, old Knuth saying um, that uh, uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. Okay? Now, I've had people level that one at me when I've made an observation about performance. I said, oh, well, Kevin, you know, premature optimization is the root of all evil. And I said, well, let's look at the most important word in that sentence, which is, funnily enough, not evil, but premature. Premature simply means before its time. Now is a good time. <laughs> yeah? And... And, uh, and you sometimes find it with projects that say, we're agile. So when you, uh, what about the performance? Oh, we're leaving that till the end. No, 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 no. You know, once you've done an increment, that increment should be in a shippable, useful state. It should be usable. And when people say usable, it doesn't mean that they're, they're, they're kind of like you know, sitting there on the edge of their seats going, oh, my God, I want to go home. Why is this taking so long? That's not usable. We're, we're, you know, but you can stand this. It's functionally correct, though. Well, if it ever gets the answer back, yes. The point here is that that matters. That's about perception. Humans operate on a time scale. Software is for users. This is one of the few areas where we actually interact with the physical world. It should be small. A very interesting property of small body of code. And then obviously, it's going, to be, it's going to be easier to make it smaller if we reduce the scope. If something is small, if you, um, if you decide that it's not the right thing, okay, because you've, you've implemented a bit, if you decide that it's not quite the right thing, you will feel much more comfortable about throwing it away and starting again. Throwing code away, can we do that? Yes. It's okay. Turns out the version control system has a most excellent memory, far better than yours. But more importantly, it gets away from a very, a very interesting psychological um, sort of side effect. It's a thing known as the endowment effect. And it also gets away from what's known as the sunk cost fallacy. The sunk cost fallacy is where we pumped so much money into a big, big project, and we can see it's not quite working. And you realize in your heart of hearts, actually, we should probably restart it or throw it away. Or this, this whole section of the code base really needs to be reworked because it's only adding cost by adding to it. There's the sunk cost fallacy. Well, we spent this much money on it. You know, it'd be a shame to throw it away. No, the point is that money's gone. It's history. Yeah? You've got to live in the present tense at least for that. But there's another thing, the endowment effect. The endowment effect occurs when you are involved deeply in creating something. The more of your effort you put into it, the more value it appears to have to you, you are less reluctant to give it up. Various experiments have been done on this. Uh, I'd like to see some in, uh, in software, but uh, behavioral economists have done uh, some very interesting uh, uh, research on this. Uh, one of the classic experiments on this one is um, IKEA furniture. Get some IKEA furniture. I'm going to get you to assemble some IKEA furniture, and then we'll have some IKEA furniture pre-assembled over here. Okay? And... Um, and then we'll ask you to, then, and then it's a case of like, here is, you know, whatever the standard thing is, chair, um, uh, uh, bedside unit, whatever. And here's another one that was not built by you. How much would you sell these for? In theory, they're identical. Although, if this one was put together by somebody from Ikea, it's probably has, it's probably put together slightly better. You will value the one you've created. At a, you will put a, place a higher price on it than this other one, even though, even though they're, in theory, identical. 
we, we, we're reluctant to let it go. We will say, oh, that's worth more. So we have this problem. But if it's smaller, if it's less effort, we're more likely to give it up. And the more you do this, the more likely it is that you are comfortable doing this. This foreshadows a lot of what is now referred to as lean startup. Here's another important consideration. It should interoperate with the programs and tools the expected users are already using. Respect the ecosystem. This is very difficult sometimes when people come along and say, because obviously this is what a lot of software people do, I am going to redefine the universe. I'm going to, offer, I'm going to create something that's just absolutely fantastic. It's going to be awesome. You know, I, I, I've known people who've gone out to uh, create new IDEs because it's just going to be a completely fundamentally new way of working. And our vision is just awesome. It leaves things like Eclipse and all the rest of them way, way behind. It's just nothing's going to touch this. But the problem is it's, going to, it's out in a little universe of its own. It turns out this is really important. Um, it should be bug-free. And if that requires implementing fewer features, do it. In other words, sacrifice scope in favor of quality. This really doesn't sit well with the name worse is better. This really is about less is better, because this doesn't sound worse to me. What, you're going to produce lower bug rates? That's terrible. <laughs> Damn it, where, you know, my job is to manage bugs. Are you going to put me out of a job? You know? No. Um, and it should use parsimony subtractions as long as they don't get in the way. In other words, you want good abstractions, but don't over-abstract. Now, this was written originally at a time when there was this fear with object-oriented adoption that people would run away with the whole object-oriented concept and create infinitely complex abstractions. Now, I'm going to say that I was certainly guilty of this, and I will say that I have certainly seen this in quite a lot of code. But it turns out to have been, relatively speaking, an ill-founded fear. Because it turns out that most people don't use anywhere near enough abstraction. For every project that over-abstracts, there's sort of like 10 projects that under-abstract. You know, so, tell me about the fundamental types in your system. Well, we've got strings. Yeah. <laughs> so, in this conversation you have with your customer, your customer says, well, our business is all about strings. And we have strings, and we do, you know, we want your program to do string manipulation. We'd like to remember some of the strings. I believe you call it a database. Yes. And if you could, no, that's not how they talk. That's not the nature of their business. Right. We sell books. Oh, right. Really long strings. <laughs> so it turns out that actually we don't, you, we, we're not so much in danger of that. It can happen, but statistically, you're more likely to find a project that under-abstracts. So, do we have examples of this? Do we have examples of approaches that have been very successful by starting with something that is embarrassingly small, what an expert would consider to be way, way less than the minimum set of functionality? This is the top and tail of 200 lines of Perl. I didn't want to scare you too much, so I left the stuff in the middle out. Uh, Perl, yeah, I don't know, I've never had a great relationship with the language. Um, a friend of mine once referred to it as executable line noise. Um, uh, and this is the top and tail of, of, of some generated Perl. Um, and it, it shows, what it shows you is something from 1995. It's called the wiki. It's the original wiki. Uh, Ward Cunningham's wiki at c2.com. And it's just a very humble, you know, editable web. Very, very simple with a little markup model that is so trivial, you'd think that's really stupid. I don't want a markup model like that. And yet, it is surprisingly effective. Astonishingly so, and it's led to a lot of imitators. And in fact, the, um, if, if you think about it, the, the whole concept of wiki has become so generic in so little time that we can actually have debates about the qualities of various wikis, which shows you that this idea has kind of taken off in a big way. Uh, when we developed the um, 97 Things Every Program Should Know project, um, when I led that, I just used a version of MediaWiki to keep the stuff. Now, MediaWiki is not perfect. Um, but again, as a rough and ready idea of how to organize things, it's very interesting when you contrast it with the, uh, one of the other projects, 97 Things Every Software Architect Should Know. That tried to use a paid approach, uh, a paid wiki um, that was much more fully featured. And then guess what? You didn't use most of the features. It turns out the most important thing with MediaWiki is people kind of know it, 
and it's got version control. That's, that, it turns out that these are the most important features from our point of view. However, I'm getting sidetracked. The point here is that the wiki in its original form was embarrassingly simple. And the point is, once you make it embarrassingly simple, people can see, oh, yes, that's a good idea. We can add to that. We can build on it. You can add features. Now, there are other examples of things that ended up, that started off relatively underfeatured in a way that people would think, well, you know what? I'm sure that you can do better than that. Uh, 1995. Um, what else was happening in 1995? Well, I took this from James Irie's A Brief, Incomplete, and Mostly Wrong History of Programming Languages, which is a very good page to kill time on. 1995, a neighborhood Italian restaurant, Rasmus Lerdoff realizes that his plate of spaghetti is an excellent model for the understanding of the World Wide Web and that web applications should mimic their medium. On the back of his napkin, he designs programmable hyperlinked pasta. <laughs> PHP documentation remains on that napkin to this day. <laughs> so we actually see, you know, I, before, I mean, I, I, have a, I have this bizarre relationship with PHP. Actually, it's not that bizarre. I don't do it. Um, <laughs> The bizarre relationship is that I keep getting invited to speak at conferences where PHP is a key element. This is my fifth one now, and I always say, look, I don't do it. Yeah, that's fine. Come along. Um, and there's some very strange things that have happened to the PHP type system since 1995. Um, you know, what, a couple of people got a Java fetish, and that kind of looks kind of weird, uh, on a language that is kind of dynamically typed. Mm, very interesting uh, approach. However, um, I'm not here to bury that. Um, let's, go, let's go further back in time. Let's see what the brief, incomplete, and mostly wrong history of programming languages has to say about one of the most enduring and successful programming languages that hardcore computer scientists hate. 1972, Dennis Ritchie invents a powerful gun that shoots both forward and backward simultaneously. Not satisfied with the number of deaths and permanent maimings from that invention, he invents C and Unix. <laughs> now, there is something interesting going on here. Because C is ridiculously successful. Now, Damien Katz of Couchbase wrote this lovely blog earlier this year, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of C. The name is a, uh, is a, follows, um, it's a snow clone. It follows a pattern of uh, a paper entitled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics many, many years ago. Uh, why is it that so much of the universe seems to conform to uh, mathematical concepts or can be described like that? Um, and this is a very, very common um, thing. I always have it in the back of my mind that I want to make a slightly better C. Lots of people have this when they encounter it. I know I did when I first encountered it. Lots of people have this. Only one person has ever been successful. His name's Bjarne Straustrup. Okay? Nobody else has really been successful in creating a better C. You know, there's a couple of cases, well, not quite. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm definitely going to say that Objective-C is not a better C. I'm not entirely sure what it's a better of, because it's not as good as Smalltalk, and it's not as good as C. Um, but it's a very good Objective-C, subjectively speaking. <laughs> uh, but this point is, take the language. But he realized, you know, getting everything to fit, top to bottom, syntax, semantics, tooling, so it might not be possible or even worth the effort. What we're looking at is the fact that although the language, the language uses sufficient abstraction, having, having used assembler and having done systems programming in Fortran, I can say that C is a fantastic systems programming language. It really does allow you to talk about some of the things you really want to talk about. And there are some syntactic quirks, and we use those to filter out the people that don't know how to program C. You know, can you disentangle this declaration of a pointer to a function that returns a pointer to a function, taking an array of pointers to functions. Now, if you can do that, you've got the job, yeah? It's, it's kind of like a, a, sort, of, it's a sort of gatekeeper. Um, but there's another important point here, is that although there are quirks and there are oddities, and this is a language that accumulated oddities over, over 40 years, it is still at its core, surprisingly effective. Its syntax is actually reasonably well thought out, and it's fairly stable, and, uh, and so on. But importantly, it allows you to have a small implementation compared to many languages, and it has the ecosystem 
This is the important point. This is actually one of the reasons that Bjorn strauss is one of the few people who's successfully managed to extend it, is because he said, well, people keep talking about reusable code and reusing code, and then they go off and create a new programming language, which doesn't allow you to use any of the code in the existing programming languages. So if you're gonna talk reuse, maybe you should walk the talk as well. And so he created a language that allowed you to link straight to C. And that was his, that was his premise, and kept really close to it. This is very different to Objective-C, um, which takes the C layer and then says, and over that we will float a small talkish type of thing. Yeah, and that's not the same thing. What, uh, what Bjarne said is like, we're gonna do it like this. So this whole idea of the respecting the ecosystem uh, is fundamental and actually using that as the primary driver. As it stands today, C is unreasonably effective and I don't see that changing anytime soon. When we look at programming languages, most programming languages are written in this. It's one of the most popular open source languages. Operating systems are written in, in this stuff. If they're not written in C, then they're written in something that either extends C or in C++. You know, the point there is that this is ridiculously effective. But it's one of those things that started off by a design that aimed to not be the perfect language. It was originally designed to solve a very specific problem, and so it had a reduced scope, a very, fo a very strong focus, and it has grown over time. So we are in the, we are sort of caught in this trap, in the thrall of this idea of beauty. And we kind of get this from scientists as they wander around saying things like, you know, it must be beautiful. I've got a whole book of equations on this kind of thing. The whole, whole idea that there's a sort of symmetry to nature and that there is an attractiveness to this. We see it reflected in books like this, Beautiful Code, which actually most of the code is not particularly beautiful in that book. It's a very good book, I will say but most of it is surprisingly pragmatic. Most of it is not based primarily on its aesthetics, um, or rather the beauty has come because of its utility. There's a nice piece in there on, uh, on uh, uh, Python's um, uh, uh, dictionary structure, um, which is principally driven by its, its uh, utility. Um, we have programming language designs that reflect a very pure and symmetric view of the programming universe. And we have lots of people wandering around going, why did this not become more successful? Why are we not programming in Smalltalk 80? Or some variant thereof. What happened? Because this is a pure and wonderful object-oriented language. Well, I'll tell you what happened. Um, about 25 years ago, 20 to 25 years ago, there was the whole showdown. The, everything was up for grabs. Object orientation, people sort of talking about it. And there was this question, is it going to be C++? Is it going to be Smalltalk? Is it going to be Objective-C? Is it going to be half a dozen languages, the names of which people have now forgotten? Which one of these is it going to be? And now with hindsight, I could have told you absolutely guaranteed that it was going to be C++ that was going to win out of all of these, hands down, and was going to influence the design of the next generation. In other words, why is it that most of the programming languages we talk about look like sort of relatives, syntactic relatives of C++. There is a very simple reason. And I can relate that to the fact that I had a PC at home. Now, how many gigabytes do you reckon this PC had? <laughs> yeah, well, let's talk fractions. Let's talk all that clock, gigahertz. No, 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 no. We didn't even know, people didn't even know that giga was the next one up from mega. People were just coming to grips with kilo, you know? I talked to my kids about this, this stuff, and, you know, but my, my older boy, he's been asking me questions about storage because he's, he's, he's trying to work out if, if, he, if he can persuade me to get him a new laptop or something like this. And he wants to know more about these numbers. And, they, and he wants to know some of the little numbers that also pop up here and there. And so he said, what's this, this? I said, that's kilobyte. What's that? I said, it's about a thousandth of a megabyte. What's the point of that, Dad? <laughs> <sighs> so I want to take you back to this time. What do you think could run on my PC? No, not this. Because the PC would easily support, I could buy, or I could rip off my university or my place of employment. I, can I confess that now? Am I outside a statute of limitations? I don't know. Um, I, could, I could get this stuff freely or cheaply. 
I could get Turbo C, I could get Turbo C++, I could get a compiler that would work on the machine. It would talk at the machine's level, the right level. We're talking kind of DOS and Windows here, okay? It would talk at that level. It would work fast on that machine. It would talk to that machine and be able to work with other things related to that machine. It would respect the ecosystem, and it would build on it. The small talk perspective was let us create a beautiful universe and run it on really expensive workstations. And I remember trying to get small talk implementations on my PC, and there were a few, DigiTalk, Small Talk. You could run it, and you could, it was great because you could watch, you could move the mouse and then watch it catch up on the screen. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, very trippy kind of effect. <laughs> the point there is that that was not small, it was not fast, it did not work with the ecosystem. It was set to carve out a completely new universe. And so this is a very, it's a very simple observation, but with hindsight, it's blindingly obvious. The fact that lots of people can get their hands on something from our stream. These days, it becomes even more obvious uh, when we can download things for free. But the, the, the dynamics have changed since then. But at that point, that set the path. So when people sort of look at this and go, well, you know, tell me about these pure object models that you've got. Well, Alan Kay, he invented small talk. And he had a very specific view, which is often lost on how people approach this stuff. Object-oriented programming to me means only messaging, local retention and protection, and hiding of state process, and extreme late binding of all things. Notice he doesn't say anything about inheritance. People got distracted by that. That's not actually a, a mainly, a, that's not an interesting OO feature. It's, a, it's kind of a sideshow. Um, he talks about message passing, not so much method calling. It's, it's very, very specific. It's the idea of... You take the machine, you decompose it into smaller machines, and smaller machines build those machines, and so on. It's a very simple kind of model. It's all about the relationships and interactions. Very late binding, but I love it. He's, he has quite an ego and <laughs> quite a disdain for many things. Um, it can be done in small talk and in Lisp. There are possibly other systems in which this is possible, but I'm not aware of them. He only said this in the last few years. <laughs> so what does a pure object model look like? These guys delved into some theory. This is a book, Theory of Objects. Um, Abadi and Cardelli. Um, it came out in 1995. It is, it's mostly unreadable. Um, it's got five or six sections. The first section is written in English. The remaining sections are written in something called Sigma Calculus. Um, <laughs> and they don't even use the regular symbol for Sigma. Uh, sigma. Uh, sigma. So, you know, it's... it's um, and they, they say in the first section, in a purest view of OO, Dynamic dispatch is the only mechanism for taking advantage of attributes that have been forgotten by subsumption. In other words, um, by the notion of inheritance, when you're looking at an object, you can send messages to it, but you have no idea of its implementation. Notice here, they are talking about the idea of polymorphism as a form of encapsulation. Because you don't know the thing that's doing it. You don't know how it's implementing it. That's the ultimate encapsulation. So they also observe this position is taken on... Uh, abstraction grounds. No knowledge should be obtainable about objects except by invoking their methods. So this is a really pure view. Okay, really pure view. Now, can we actually implement this in anything other than sigma calculus? Can we do this in something other than Lisp and small talk? Believe it or not, this is true. It's an observation from William Cook. It is possible to do object-oriented programming in Java. Uh, I, used to, I used to use this as a talk title. Um, it's slightly provocative, given that it was supposed that's what it's supposed to do. Um, actually, most of what they describe, most of what people think of as objects in uh, object-oriented programming in Java, uh, in PHP, in C++, these are not, it's not really the object model that I've just described in these other slides. Um, but it has a very restricted view. The OO subset is the class name only appears after new. In other words, you only ever use it as a creation. Class is only implementation. Everything else is interface, and you use interfaces. Okay. So this also is quite provocative. One of the most pure object-oriented models, programming models yet defined, is the component object model, Microsoft's COM. William Cook observes this in his way. I made a very major part of my career out of... of <laughs> saying bad things about COM. And when I read this, it enforces all of these principles rigorously. It's a good job I was sitting down at the time because I would have fallen over had I not already been sitting down. I suddenly realized he's right. Damn it, he's right. It's 
actually a really pure implementation. It's based on a C++ model that is close to the machine at the time, this is the mid-90s, this made a lot of sense, early to mid-90s, made a lot of sense. It was efficient compared to every other um, object middleware model out there. This thing just ran rings around them in terms of performance. And it was, and it was actually really minimal in its approach. And it was, uh, it was messy. There's a lot of ugliness to it. But actually, at its heart, I suddenly realized, you know, he's right. And it was sufficient. It was enough to create a market. Now, there is another observation that he makes, um, although I'm going to correct the year. Lambda calculus was the first object-oriented language. 1932. Does PHP have lambdas yet? Yeah, when did that happen? <laughs> That's really cool. You can now like do some of that really funky 1930s style programming. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Yeah, great. But actually, what, what really introduced lambdas to the masses? Yeah, it certainly wasn't Lisp, but it certainly wasn't any of these other things. I don't know. It's, uh, this is what we like to think. The past. Lisp. This is where it's at. Beautiful book, by the way. But no, what actually happened, um, we got this. This is our view. It's got lambdas, and it's lovely. This is a stack. Everybody uses stack examples, and this is your perfect example of the stack. So what do we end up with? JavaScript. That's an almost direct translation. JavaScript. How did that, that got to, that was kind of stealth lambdas. There was a whole load of messy syntax, some really weird compromises, some stuff to make sure that everybody stayed in a job, and then lambdas out in the mainstream, out in the wild. This is just unheard of. It was just really quite surprising. It's just like, it's got lambdas. Good grief. I thought that was just, you only heard of that at university. So we've ended up with this rather than this pure Lisp view of the universe. That, this is what's triggered everybody's interest ultimately in lambdas. Everybody kind of talked about them. You know, the, these kind of ideas of being able to pass code blocks around have been around for a long time. Um, let me think. Not just Lisp, but in fact, Algol, the ultimate predecessor of, uh, of C and all, that, uh, and all that lot, allowed you to pass blocks of code around as if they were objects. Hmm, interesting idea. I wonder if anybody will make something of that. Well, they did in, you know, 1967. It's called Simula, the first object-oriented language. But they, they kind of lost the whole, you can just pass the block of code around. You can just capture closure. You can just pass it. So it took this. Uh, just as an aside, it's a great book. Um, not, it's worth pointing out the title. It's a very slim book. Um, <laughs> uh, you, take a, you take a moment. <laughs> uh, we also have this rather fascinating observation that this has created of itself, on its, on its own, it's not enough. But it, it, in conjunction with the browser, it has created an ecosystem. This is what kids hack on these days. And this has created an ecosystem that people have been, that was not originally fast. And it didn't matter that it wasn't originally fast because your modem was slower. <laughs> but people have been drawn to make it fast. Performance is the critical thing. And when, the perform when we entered the performance wars for JavaScript, that changed the game. Guess what? It made the thing acceptable. The speed. Nobody messed around with the syntax much. Well, the semantics. But the speed suddenly became critical. That started defining it. People started working around with that. I mean, to the point that, you know, we have... Um, let's just move uh, that there, and then... Uh, let's just do that. There we go. Okay, so... This is um, Fabrice Bellard's um, uh, JavaScript Linux. Um, what you've got there... Uh, is um, a, uh, an emulator, Intel emulation, written in JavaScript. Linux is running on top of that. You got that there, and that's running inside Chrome um, on uh, a Windows box with modern Intel technology, which runs at another level down. The, the, the instruction set you see is not what's actually going on. The instruction set you see, you know, we, we, the whole idea of an instruction set for a chip, oh, that's so retro. The instruction set is like a high-level language that's implemented in a low, lower-level language inside the chip. 
You know, it's, it's, um, so we've, we've got this, I mean, you know, and, and we've, got all the, we've got all kinds of stuff here, you know? It's like, ooh, yeah. Um, traditional first program, wow. Yeah, C, yeah? Guess what the default language on this is, C. Um, however, I do want to correct something, so I'm a little bit uncomfortable with this. Um, uh, let's see. That comma matters, <laughs> okay? Right? I want you to think of the difference. Um, let's eat, Grandma, and let's eat Grandma. <laughs> okay? Punctuation saves lives. <laughs> you have to wait a moment for this one. It, it, you know. Oh, there we go. That's not bad. Yes, we have programming. This is not quite so fast. There we go. <laughs> but if you try and do anything in here, I mean, at this level, you're now, you're now well, if you've watched Inception, you'll understand how deep we are. <laughs> so let's go back to something that has been kicking around in the background here. It's one of the classic examples uh, of this is, um, uh, is basically is... Uh, is Unix. I mean, it was, uh, Unix was passed around um, basically by its availability. This is uh, my copy of uh, the John Lyons uh, book. Um, uh, he, uh, he was at the University uh, of uh, New South Wales, and he wanted to teach a course on operating systems in the 1970s, so he, made, he created a whole set of notes which got passed around by photocopying. Um, for those of you who are not old enough to know what a photocopier is, it's like scanning. Um, <laughs> but more sociable um, because, with, you know, what you do is you hang out at the university library and you have a card and you spend a ridiculous amount of money and time there and you're just kind of hoping that, you know, you can strike up a good conversation with somebody who's way out of your attraction league whilst you're casually, you know, this is pretty cool, Unix, huh? Yeah. Ah, oh, didn't work with the art students. Um, but it, did, it helped describe what was going on in terms of how it got passed around. But really importantly was that some elements of the design. Uh, the late Dennis Ritchie uh, observed in this paper, there have always been fairly severe size constraints on the Unix operating system and its software. In other words, there is a, we are working to a constraint. The constraint was performance, the constraint was memory. Um, which, uh, given the partially antagonistic desires for reasonable efficiency and expressive power, in other words, we've got to manage the scope. There's this question of intentionally managing the scope. Can we create a programming model that is extensible so we can add stuff later? The size constraint has encouraged not only economy, but a certain elegance of design. So there is an, another interesting thing, is that when we take this approach of actually giving ourselves an edge, a creative boundary to work against such as reducing scope or reducing resources uh, in, in some way, that actually you're more likely to get something uh, that has aesthetic and uh, uh, sort of um, usability uh, interest. Um, and there are a few other observations. Doug McElroy um, uh, made this wonderful observation, this kind of uh, design philosophy, if you like, um, that we find uh, still with us, that it allowed them to build up this whole approach. Um, so we find that it is anything but messy, their vision of how to create design. And that's what I'm really trying to drive home here, is that they had a very strong vision. The Unix philosophy, write programs that do one thing and do it well. Write programs to work together. Write programs to handle text streams, because that is a universal interface. Now, John Cook made this observation. The hard part isn't writing little programs that do one thing well. Actually, that's quite hard for a lot of people. We'll come back to why that is. It's, no, people, aren't, people aren't stupid. Okay. The hard part is combining little programs to solve bigger problems. Macro's summary, the hard part is the second sentence, right programs to work together. Now, this ties in with this idea that when you're creating any kind of product, respect the ecosystem, understand the ecosystem. You can't take it all with you, but you need to connect to something in it. It's not simply a reason why certain standards are important, but it's also understanding who's going to be using this, what else are they likely to be using? Are we trying to make the case that ours is so much better that they will replace their universe with our universe, or have we got a slightly more worse is better approach? In other words, um, the idea of let's give up something in order to get something by being, as it were, rather than competing by a process of collaboration with other software, that will make our software valuable. 
So this idea of working together, that can be hard. It's non-trivial. Um, so there is a point here, though, that he also does observe. Getting it to do one thing well is actually also quite hard. Have you, uh, I, I tweeted a couple of days ago, um, so something I picked up off Roy Osharov, um, that uh, there's a particular project where a guy had announced it, you know, hey, it's up on, you know, new version's up on GitHub, you know, we've got you know, loads of tests, yeah, fantastic. Um, uh, yeah, we've got 10,000 lines of test code, cool, in one file. <laughs> you know, just because you're writing tests does not mean you abandon any kind of sense of sanity that you ever had and any kind of sense of good practice. 10,000 lines of anything is not, it's not a good, good start in one file. I mean, okay, let me, let me just ask you a very simple question, because this is all about human perception. What's the difference between 10,000 lines and 20,000 lines in a file? 10,000, you see? Your problem is, you know what your problem is? You're too educated. You've had years of education that have fed you all kinds of useful stuff about number systems. 20,000 is twice 10,000. There's an absolute difference of 10,000. I can express it in a number of different ways. Yeah, two times 10 to the four, I can, yeah. there's loads of ways of describing that. But the problem is, at the same time as this highly educated thing that you've got going on up here, there's another piece of your brain that's running in parallel. And this is the bit of the brain that counts one, two, three, many. I see many of you. There's more than three, I can see that. This part of your brain is, uh, basically you appreciate numbers logarithmically. So the problem is we are overly educated and we think that the numbers that we're seeing mean something, but actually from a perception point of view, this really matters when you're actually working with it. When you are working with 10,000 lines of code in one file, there is precisely no difference between working with that and 20,000 lines of code. You pass the point where it would make a difference a few thousand lines ago. Yeah? In other words, you're dealing with the difference between, wow, that's a lot, and wow, that's a lot. <laughs> there, is no, there is no difference. If I, if, you know, I could even double it overnight, and you wouldn't notice unless you look down at the bottom. And say, where did that come from? Where did this, that's... <laughs> the point is, it's just so ridiculous that you know, it, it, we, we don't appreciate that. And this is the problem. This is how things get large. Um, and as he notes here, um, we, this is one of the reasons that classes get large. People don't like the idea of transaction costs, in other words, switching from one context to another. But there's also a, a way of chunking, because this, this is one of the things that humans do, is we chunk. We use approximate units. So, it's almost time for a drink, actually. And here are two glasses. Okay? Um, the, the one on the left is the one that my wife and I used to, uh, you know, used to use. We, now, we try to use that less now. It's the one on the right. Um, you see, the problem is to do with quantification. Um, the one on the right, if you fill it to the brim, is 150 milliliters. You see what I've done there? I've given you a precise answer. It's got, it's got numbers and everything. The milliliter is a standardized unit. It's, it's great, you know, and it, fantastic. And the one on the left is about 250 mils. How much did you have to drink last night? Three glasses of wine. <laughs> on the left, that's a whole bottle. Okay, we use these approximate units. We have this, oh, you know, so did you eat much for lunch? I had a plateful. Do we have, is there an ISO standard for plate? <laughs> and when you say full, I mean, are we talking, you know, <laughs> we just, we've just passed the uh, anniversary, a uh, significant anniversary of where uh, uh, Edmund Hillary and, um, uh, and uh, his Sherpa Tenzing uh, <laughs> scaled Everest. I mean, is that what we're talking about when we say a plateful? So, the, so this whole idea is that we use these approximate units. How, how much code have you done? Oh, it's not a big system, it's only five classes, but have you seen the classes? <laughs> so there is this tension, there, there is this tension, this worse is better doesn't come for free, it can actually come with worse because we lose the idea of small, we, we evaluate small incorrectly. So, oh, it's only a few classes, actually no, we've let it become a monster. Well, could you throw it away easily? Oh, I'm not sure about that. How do you know it's correct? I have no idea. You know, I pray a lot, maybe. I don't know. You know? 
So the point here is there's a, there's a reaction there. This, I mean, if it was so easy, there would be no problem here. So there is, there is a point here that you do have to push up against and realize there is a constant cycle of feedback and self-awareness to make this approach work. And that there is an element to it um, that allows, you know, allows us to challenge this, this whole question that bugs us. What is our architecture? Our architecture is the decisions that you wish you could get right early in a project, which is why we try to think really hard at the beginning. But you're no more likely to get them right than any other. It's Ralph Johnson's very practical definition of architecture. So there's a certain element of giving up. But not giving up in a bad way. I mean giving up in the sense of letting go. You know, it's, uh, it's a very, uh, very good book that uh, I've got um, uh, a couple of years back. 101 Things I Learned in Architecture School by Matthew Frederick. And it's about real architecture, buildings. Um, half of the guidelines in here are applicable to any design discipline. You go through them, and, and anything where there is some kind of creativity uh, involved, there's a lot of really good stuff in here. One of the really nice uh, quotes here is, properly gaining control of the design process tends to feel like one is losing control of the design process. This is what I mean by letting go or giving up. Giving up that hold on the perfect design to actually end up with a design that's really quite good, but you won't know it at the beginning. You start with something relatively humble and are open to the idea that it might change and are even open to the idea you might revise and come up with the opposite opinion and even the opposite functionality to what you started with. And you may throw out code. And there's that op openness to revision, that revisiting. Um, so in closing, uh, Jim Waldo, um, formerly of Sun Microsystems, he wrote... This little uh, observation a few years ago. Uh, the classic essay on worse is better is either misunderstood or wrong. And I'm, hopefully I've made the case here that it is misunderstood, that what Dick Gabriel was offering was a very different kind of perspective, some of which sounds familiar, but some of which is still kind of surprisingly provocative and fresh, uh, and is definitely worth revisiting. But as Dick says, decide for yourselves. Thank you very much. It's great seeing you all here again, but um, unfortunately the conference is at its ending. Uh, did you all have a good time here? Can I? Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> Got to put this one on. Yeah. While you're in a cheering mood, how about a quick round of applause for our speakers? Yeah, we couldn't have had a conference without them, but if you want to thank them, by the way, please leave feedback and join in. And of course, we have our sponsors. Uh, without them, the conference couldn't be possible either, so please give a warm applause for our sponsors as well. We'd also like to thank Jeroen van Dijk for helping organize the unconference. It may not seem like a lot of work, but it's a lot of work. Yeah, and also thank you so much for our unconference speakers. Now, as you may have heard yesterday morning and this morning, the best unconference speaker of the year gets a guaranteed slot at DPC 14. So in order to announce that, the man himself. The stage is yours. I won't take too long because uh, it's already late. Um, there were quite a few good talks, but there were a couple that stood out. And there was difficult to choose. <laughs> Yesterday there was one, but today there was also one. So I had a discussion with iBuildings and we decided in the end to give away two slots even. <clears throat> so it's today, uh, there were a couple of guys and he only had one slide, but his whole story was great, quite good. It's Clinton Ingrams. Is he here? Can you please? Is there? He will be here for next year back. 
<laughs> and yesterday, um, he improvised. He had a couple of good slides. He had laughs. And it's Pascal de Vink. Good luck next year. If you're sad the conference is over, don't be too sad. You can take it with you on the go now. We've make an, uh, made audio recordings of uh, everything at the conference, and we're also going to make a video of some selected talks. You can find these on our website, phpconference and mobileconference.nl, and we'll announce on Twitter whenever these are ready. You can also find last year's already on the site. And finally, again, please, please, please join in feedback. Helps us make a better conference, helps everybody else get, make better talks. And lastly, evaluation for us is always appreciated. So we'd like to send you an evaluation form in your email inbox. If you can please take a look at that, take the time to fill it out. We'll make it up to you by sending out, a, uh, sending out an e-goodie bag, which should have some very nice uh, discounts. Uh, we'll have a ticket raffle for DPC and DMC over there. We'll have another ticket raffle for PHP UK, as well as some great discounts from JetBrains and TransIP and much, much more. OK, then there's, there's just one thing left to do, drinks. The we're done with the conference. We'd like to thank you all for coming. If you uh, leave the area, uh, you will get to the lounge. There will be drinks there. You can stay and chat and just have fun. And we hope to see you again next year. Thank Thanks you so much all. for coming.